Grab your seat, go ahead and grab your Bible, and I want you to find your way to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. All right, so here's, here's where we're at today, okay? If you've been around, you know that over the last several months, we've been studying the short but just like powerful, great Old Testament book of Jonah. And as we kind of finished up that, that teaching series last week, we learned a lot. We learned a lot about ourselves, in fact, that we actually are Jonah, but maybe even more profoundly, we learned a lot about God that we learned about the power of God, the love of God, the patience of God, the salvation of God. And today, we are, as we officially kind of switch gears all right, for the next few weeks to celebrate and examine Christmas, these things that we have been learning, these things that we have been being reminded of, I want you to understand that these are going to be reinforced. All right, that these aren't just things that we find in the, in the book of Jonah, but this is really just the storyline of the entire Bible. And as we get into this, guys, we've all have heard and likely sang the famous uh, Christmas song, um, Joy to the World, right? Well, in that song that so many people sing uh, around Christmas, the words, some of the words say this, let every heart prepare him room. You remember this? Because this is what we're, we're doing throughout the next few weeks leading up to Christmas. All right, we're simply just preparing our hearts to celebrate Jesus. And the way that we're going to do this is by simply just opening up the Bible and looking at the first Christmas. And we're going to find this in, in Matthew chapter 1 and 2. But as we open up the Bible today, guys, here's what I'm, I'm hoping and I'm praying. I'm praying that God helps us move, move past like just all the fanfare and the noise that our culture offers around the Christmas season. You with me? All right, that in many ways, guys, I, I love the Christmas season. All right, I, I love that it's like built into my yearly rhythm to make me like focus and remember and celebrate the birth of Jesus. I love how actually this season like truly does stir worship within me of Jesus as I remember how he came from heaven to earth for me. But here's, here's where I'm at. I don't know if you're here, but this is where I'm at. While I love this season, I simultaneously loathe this season, mainly because of what it's become culturally. The, the, the commercialism, the, the excess spending, just the idolatry, all of it is just so far off of what Christmas is all about. And as I've been thinking about this, I've been, I've been imagining like the angels in heaven, all right, just kind of having a conversation about this as they look down on us. And, and I, I, just, I just picture them that there's probably some humor, there's probably some like disgust, but it's like the angels are in heaven right now and they're like talking, like, you see what they're doing now? And the other guy's like, no, what's going on? He's like, they got inflatables now. <laughs> Seriously, check it out, an inflatable baby Jesus, right? And this guy's like, oh my gosh, can we just go to God and tell him to speed up the end times counter? Like, it's just like, it's crazy, right? <laughs> but guys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put aside all that stuff, all the distractions around Christmas, and what we're going to do is just kind of press in to the message behind every single one of our Christmas celebrations. And my prayer is, is that as we would do this, we would be reminded of the life-changing, or maybe you would come to understand the life-changing, eternity-altering understanding of Christmas, which revolves around the man Jesus Christ. And so, so many people, when it comes to Christmas, they know the basics of the Christmas story. I, I bet you the majority, if not all of us, we, we kind of know the basics of, of the Christmas story, that there's Jesus in a, as a baby in a manger. But I need you to understand, this is just part of the story. And if you're here and, and that's all you know of the Christmas story, I know that this can produce like kind of warm, sentimental feelings, but it cannot produce true worship. And that is my goal today. It's worship. That as we open the Bible, that our understanding of Christmas would just expand and that our worship of Jesus we would worship him with more of our hearts as we leave this place today. And so Matthew chapter 1, this is a gospel account, all right? So which means that this is a historical account that's all about the birth, the life, the ministry, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And in verse 18, we come to the birth of Jesus on that first Christmas. And here is what Matthew records. Now the birth of Jesus Christ, and I want you to underline this next part in your Bible, took place in this way. Now, I need you to understand this, okay? If, if you're newer to the Bible, if you're newer to understanding Christianity, this is so incredibly important, all right, that the Bible is primarily about history. It's about historical things that actually happen. And this is where Christianity is like totally different from philosophy or spirituality because it's really ultimately about history, that the God who made the world 
is at work in the world. And this God shows up in particular times and in particular ways, and he says particular things. And so when the Bible opens up here in Matthew chapter 1 and says that Jesus came this way, what that means is that we actually know how Jesus came because God was faithful to give us a credible account rooted in history of how he came down from eternity. And as we get into this series, guys, we're going to discover that Christmas is ultimately telling us that we could never get up to God. That we can't get up to God in heaven, but God actually had to come down to us as the man Jesus. This is what Christmas is ultimately all about, and his name is Jesus. And then Matthew goes on to say this, look back. When his mother, Mary, had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit, verse 19, and her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But he considered these things. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now, as you can imagine that this is a weird, stressful, fearful moment for Joseph. I mean, guys, just think about this. Right? You find the girl of your dreams, you love her, you pursue her, you date her, she becomes your fiance, you're waiting, you're planning this wedding, and all of a sudden she's like, oh, by the way, I got this, this thing, I'm pregnant. And you're kind of like, hey, I don't know a lot about a lot, but I know I would remember that, okay, right? I, I know how that works. And Joseph's just this godly dude. He's thinking, I'm trying to do this the right way. And all of a sudden, she's saying she's pregnant. He's mad, probably. He's frustrated. He's fearful. He doesn't know what to do. But I love this about Joseph. He's not a perfect man, but he's a godly man. And he decides in his heart, I'm not going to shame this woman. I don't understand what's going on. I'm angry. I'm hurt. But he doesn't want to put her to public shame. And so he's like, I'm going to divorce her quietly. And then in a dream, an angel comes to Joseph. And we've talked a lot about this. Guys, for, for God, there's, there's two realms but one reality. All right? There's the physical realm with human beings and then there's the spiritual realm with spirit beings and these are called the angels. And we are surrounded by the ministry of angels all the time. We might not see it, but we understand this is actually true from God's word. And God sends an angel to Joseph and this angel comes to him and says, hey, this thing that's happening right now, it's a miracle that God has intervened in a miraculous way and he's doing something and he has done something that's never before happened, it's never going to happen again, and God is going to come into human history by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit born of a virgin woman as a baby. And maybe you would come more skeptical to the Bible and kind of push on this and say, man, I don't, I, this doesn't, I don't, that doesn't make sense, you can't, I can't logically. Guys, I want you to know this might be a mystery and it might be a miracle. We might not be able to fully comprehend it, but that does not negate it as true. And so the angel says, look back to verse 21. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? I want you to underline this on your Bible. For he will save his people from their sins. And so I'll speak to you guys. If, if maybe if you're newer to Doxa and you're kind of checking things out, and you might be asking the question, like, why do they make such a big deal about Jesus? Like, maybe you've been coming here and you, you know, the last couple weeks, and you're like, man, they seem nice enough. They don't seem that weird, right? But they talk about Jesus all the time. I know that there's over under bets happening all the time of how many times we're going to say Jesus on the stage. Why do they talk about Jesus so much? Here it is. This is it. This is the why. And this is ultimately the reason for Jesus coming. That Jesus, the name literally means God our Savior. And what you need to know and what we all need to know is that we're all sinners and we all need a Savior. And even if you're here and you're not particularly interested in all that's going on and anything that I'm saying, I need you to know that this is particularly pointed towards you and me. It's for all of us. This is true of every single one of us, whether or not we want to believe it or listen to it or not. That even the seemingly great among us, the moral, the, the philanthropic, the religious, the, the really great Christians among us, every single one of us, myself included, is broken and messed up with sin. And every single one of us desperately need a Savior. That sin in our lives has put a death sentence over our lives. And while we can try, we cannot save ourselves. We can't save ourselves, and many of you try. I know that. 
And while religion can't save and morality can't save and spirituality can't save, our good deeds can't save, Jesus can. Amen? This is why we love him so much. And Christmas is just a reminder that we all need a rescue and Jesus comes as our Savior to do this for us. And as Jesus is born and steps out on the stage of human history, he does so to save us from sin, death, hell, and the wrath of God that is coming for sin. This is Jesus. And Matthew goes on to say this. Look at verse 22. And I want you to underline that verse 22 in your Bible. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So, this is the simple account of the birth of Jesus. But here's what I want to do. Look back to verse 22. All this, all the stuff that's surrounding the birth of Jesus took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophets. Here's what you need to know. Guys, when, when it comes to the Bible, 25% of it, as it was written, was prophetic in nature. All right, and prophecy is simply God revealing the future in advance. All right, prophecy is all about God's promises. And this is so important all right, because there are two threads that weave together the entire Bible. It's promise and fulfillment. Promise and fulfillment. And you see this as you read the Bible. And the Old Testament would simply fall under the category mainly of, of promise. And then the New Testament and then all of recorded human history is the recording of fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus. And so we see promise and fulfillment. It's God making promises and telling the future and then fulfillment. God showing himself to be sovereign over all creation, causing it to pass just as he said. And this is what I want to consider this morning. Because when it comes to the Bible, guys, these prophecies in the Bible that we see are incredibly detailed all about Jesus. And that makes it more like unlike any other religious book in the history of the world. It's, it's significant. Scholars tell us that the, in the Bible, at the very lowest is maybe 61. At the very highest is right over 300 prophecies given about the coming of Jesus Christ, which is exactly what we're celebrating this Christmas season. And so we're going to do, what we're going to do is we're going to look back in history, hundreds and thousands of years into human history, and see how God was preparing his people for the coming of his son and the Savior, Jesus. And as we do this, guys, here's the big idea. I want you to understand this. The Bible is true, and Jesus is God. And I'm going to show you why you need to believe this today. So we're going to look at this. 4,000 years before Jesus Christ is where we're going to start. But 4,000 years before the entrance of Jesus, on the stage of human history, there existed the first of humanity. All right, it's Adam and Eve. All right, that God created everything. If you remember, Genesis literally means the book of origins, Genesis 1 and 2. God creates everything, everything that we see and we don't see. And at the pinnacle of his creation is humanity. And he created Adam and Eve in his image, which means he had, that they bear his image, they have dignity and value and purpose. And this is true of all of humanity. This is true of you. This affects the way that we view the world. This is why we don't stand for the murder of people and the taking of lives. And we, don't, we cannot agree and, and support abortion because human life is special. Humanity is made in the image and the likeness of God, giving all life value. And this includes yours. And this was Adam and Eve in the garden. And in their experience with God, guys, it was perfection. Absolute perfection. They were with God and God was lo loving them and speaking to them and hearing them. But in the midst of this perfection, Adam and Eve did what we all do, which breaks relationship with God. And they sinned. The first of humanity ushered into, into our experience just brokenness. And this is, if, if you don't know this, this is really helpful. Some people don't like to talk about sin. It's actually really helpful to talk about sin because sin is the reason why your life is so hard. Sin is the reason why your marriage is so difficult. Sin is the reason why your tears flow from your face. It's sin. It's a result of sin. 
And sin is just anything that God is not. It's anything and everything that's in opposition to who God is and what God says. And sin is a real part of every single one of our lives. None of us are sinless. There's one and his name is Jesus. The rest of us, we are broken. That we all do things that we shouldn't do. We don't do the things that we should. And the Bible just calls this sin. And sin brings about separation and it brings about death. And we see this with the first of humanity here in Genesis. That when they sinned against God, they were separated from God and they were separated from each other. They hid from God, they covered themselves and they hid from each other. But that also ushered in death into the human experience. If you have kids and your kids start to ask you questions, and like, why do, we, why do people die? It's not that we have like a, a time clock built into us that we finally run out of juice and do this. We see from the scriptures that it's actually a result of sin. Sin brings death. Physical death and spiritual death. And we learn this truth in, in Genesis chapter 3 and Romans chapter 6. That we all die physically, but we also die spiritually. And we see this in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, that if sin is not mediated in our lives, please hear me. Someone needs to hear this. If sin is not mediated in your life, you will not only die physically, but you will die spiritually and experience eternal separation from God, which is just the terrible conscious reality of hell. But in the midst of this, guys, you need to know this about our God. He is so loving and he is so patient, not wanting anyone to perish, the Bible says. And he comes and he lovingly pursues these people that sinned against him. And God could have just let him go. Let him go towards sin and death and destruction, but his love compelled him to move and to pursue them. And this is what he did with Adam and Eve, but this is what he still does today. And some of you here, you don't even know this, but God, he is lovingly pursuing you. And that's in fact why you're here. And you might not call it that. You might say, I'm here for my family. My girlfriend said it's the next step. I'm here to support my friend that's getting baptized. I'm here because last night was terrible and I need to sprinkle in a little church into my life to make me feel better. You might have all types of reasons why you're here. I need you to understand that you're ultimately here as part of God's pursuit for you. That he loves you. He's got a plan for you. He wants to speak to you. He wants to meet you. And he wants to tell you about Jesus. And this is what he does with the first of humanity in Genesis chapter 3. After they sin, God shows up and he says this, look, Genesis 3, I will put enmity between you and the woman. So God is speaking to Satan, the great deceiver, and he says, I'm going to put enmity between you and this woman and between your offspring and her offspring. This offspring of this woman is Jesus And then he says, he shall bruise your head. Jesus will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Guys, theologians refer to this as the proto-evangelium or the first gospel. That the first gospel promise that God made in the coming of Jesus, which is why we celebrate Christmas, is right here. 4,000 years before Jesus was born, God says, hey, there's a big problem in this world and in your life and it's sin. And I have a solution, and it's Jesus. And he's the only one who's going to be able to conquer sin and death. And here's what I want you to know, guys. We live in a world, and we live in a culture that is all about trying to fix things. That's all about trying to better things. That's why this world is about to get crazy in election season, because so many put, people put their hope in an election, in a person, in a policy. An election, a person, a policy is a terrible God. They will always let you down. But we live in a world that's obsessed with making things right. I want you to know, guys, when it comes to sin in our relationship with God, human beings are the problem, therefore we can't be the solution. And so there is nothing that any of us can do to restore our broken relationship with God because of sin. And some of you, and I'm hoping that this breaks the cycle today, some of you will spend a great deal of your life trying to break that cycle of sin and fix your relationship with God on your own. And we will spend so much time and so much money finding a great counselor or an awesome life coach voting for this particular person, but that won't fix 
anything. And God kind of breaks in and says, those things, they might bring temporary relief and help to you in the moment, but it won't bring lasting help to you for eternity. And God lovingly tells us that our problem is sin and his only answer is Jesus. You need to understand that. And the rest of the Bible, from the first book of the Bible here in Genesis, is really just all about God elaborating on this to prepare people for the coming of Jesus Christ, the, sin, the Savior for sinners, who is what Christmas is all about. But here, he says the son will come from a woman, and so this is pointing to Jesus and Mary, his mother, 4,000 years in advance. And this leads to the words of a prophet named Isaiah, all right? Some 700 years before Christ. This is the second prophecy. I want you to see this. It's going to pop up here. If you've been to Hobby Lobby over the last couple weeks, you for sure have seen this. You've been to your grandma's house, guarantee you she's got a plaque hanging up that has this for Christmas, okay? This is the hallmark verse. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Well, what is that sign? Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Okay, so 700 years before the birth of Jesus, God promises that the Savior of humanity from sin would be born of a virgin woman and she would give birth to a son. And if you know your Bible and if you know history, you know that this is actually Mary. This is Jesus' mother. And I want, you, I want to share this with, with you about Mary, okay? Mary was just this young, unmarried, betrothed, poor teenage girl. I love this about God. He doesn't come showing up looking for the rich and the powerful. He comes looking for this little, teenage, poor, humble servant girl. And it tells us a lot about God and how he loves. But he shows up to her and he chooses her to be the fulfillment of the prophecy that he gave to Isaiah. And so God told his people you're going to know when the Savior's here, when a baby boy is born of a virgin girl. And he says, when that day comes, you will know that this is Emmanuel. This is God come down from heaven to be with you and to save you. This is Jesus, guys. It's Emmanuel, God with us. And here's what I want you to know, guys. Christmas. Christmas reminds us that we don't go up to God, but God had to come down to us. And I need to talk about this. This is so significant because it's so creepy. The, creepy. Yeah, it is creepy. But it creeps in the way that our world views this. Guys, we live in a world filled with pride. We are such prideful people. And our lives, for the majority of us, is all about lifting ourselves up, raising ourselves up, bettering myself so that I can be seen and that I can get high enough and that I can ultimately get myself to God. And we live in a world filled with different religious ideologies which essentially say all the same thing. That every other religion in the world outside of Christianity will hand you a laundry list of things to do in order for you to find your way up to God. But Christianity simply says that's not it. Because it's not that we go up to God, it's that God comes down to us. And Jesus comes saying the only thing for you to do is to respond to the one that's come for you. And God says, you can try and raise yourself up through religion and through works of your flesh and from all the stuff that you want to do, but in doing that, you're going to miss the one I sent down for you with grace. Look to Jesus. Because this is the heart of Christmas. Our God came down from glory to lift us to glory. And it's all through Jesus. And the fulfillment of this prophecy through Mary and Jesus, was God just putting like a heavenly spotlight on that manger and on that baby and saying, this is, this is the one. He's shouting to the world that God has come to us for salvation. Now look at this. The third prophecy I want to show you is not just God telling us like how this is going to happen, but he actually shares where this would happen. All right, and we see this in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Take a look. 700 years before Christ was born, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be a ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. All right, and here's what this is all about. All right, when this prophecy says that a ruler will come from ancient days, all right, the original language that this was written in is speaking of someone coming from eternity. Someone coming from eternity and entering into history. And this is what Christmas is all about. 
that God is prophesying 700 years in advance that the Creator would enter creation. The one who is beyond time would enter into a specific moment of time in the birth of Jesus. And God tells us that he would be coming to this small town of Bethlehem. Now again, if you grew up in the church and you know your Bible and you're familiar with the Christmas story, you know that Jesus' family was not living in Bethlehem while Mary was pregnant, right? But where were they living? Anybody remember? Miles away in another small town named Nazareth. But here's what happened historically. All right, as Jesus is about to be born, all right, the government makes a decree. And actually, this is one of the only times in the history of the world that the government gets involved and something good happens, okay? So just want to make sure you're with me, okay? Don't email me. That one was free. But the Roman government, all right, the Roman government, they step in. They were ruling over these cities, and they were saying, you know what we need to find out? We need to figure out if we're getting all of our money. We need to make sure that these people are paying their taxes. And so what they do is they issue a census, and they require everybody to go back to their own town that their family originates from so that they can register and make sure they're caught up on their taxes. And so Mary and Joseph, they have to go from Nazareth to Bethlehem and register because Joseph is from the family line of David, which fulfills another prophecy that we're not going to get into, but the family line of David descends from Bethlehem. And so Joseph and Mary, they have to take this four-day journey to Bethlehem. They arrive in time to register for the census, and then the time comes, and Mary goes into labor. And guys, I just want to help you see this. Please understand this, guys. We don't have a God of history. We have a God who is over history and directing history and ruling history. Do you understand that? This is our hope. That God just orchestrates history in a perfect way just to fulfill this prophecy about where Jesus was being born. And he is that in control that he can do this. And I want you to know, guys, I don't know about you. This is, this is my story. There are times in my life, and they're kind of right now, where things just kind of seem totally out of control. You been there? And in those times where it's just like everything's swirling, everything is out of control, it can lead to kind of like fear and anxiety. But as we consider Christmas, I need you to see that God never feels that way. That God is never out of control. And that should be giving us great comfort when we feel out of control. That he is the only one that is completely in control and he's completely good. And here, what we see is that he uses a government, a pagan government that doesn't love him, acknowledge him, listen to him, follow him. He uses this government for his ultimate purpose to love and to bless and to seek and to serve and to save humanity. And so very practically, guys, the next time you feel like your life and your situation is just totally out of control, let me just encourage you to do what I'm trying to do as I think about this situation is look to the one who is in complete control and just ask him. Ask him to be a good, loving father and to help you to trust him and to rest in his peace because here is the truth, guys. Even though things are way over my head, I still know they're under his feet. Amen? This is the truth of who God is. Now let's keep going. 700 years before Jesus, God says this through the prophet Isaiah. Take a look. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Okay. So God says, here is another way that you will know when the Messiah has come. God says there is one that will come And around that person's life, you will see supernatural miracles. And what God was promising 700 years before the birth of Jesus is that Jesus, hear me on this, would not just come as a good man, but he would come as the God man. That Jesus came and that Jesus exists truly and emphatically as Emmanuel, God with us. Theologically, we refer to this as the hypostatic union. All right, and this is just a term used to describe the man who is Jesus Christ, who is both fully God and fully man. And God says to the prophet Isaiah and through the prophet Isaiah that you will know when this God-man is here because there will be miracles that surround his life. And historically, inside and outside the Bible, we know that in the days of Jesus, he raised people from the dead. 
We know that the lame ran, the sick were healed, the blind could see, the deaf could hear, and the mute could sing the praises of God. In fact, in Luke chapter 7, when people were trying to figure out who Jesus was, they were watching him do all these miracles, and then John, the baptizer, comes and he's like, who is this guy? They're inquiring about who Jesus is, his identity. Jesus tells him, and he quotes this prophecy, and he says, the blind see. You want to know who I am? The blind see. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. Jesus is saying, I am the fulfillment of this prophecy. I am the Messiah. Guys, there is no one like Jesus. And there will be, and never be anyone like Jesus. And when Jesus came the first time, he came not with just great words, but with miraculous signs. And the miracles that surrounded Jesus' life fulfilled this prophecy and validated every single thing that he said. That Jesus declared himself openly and publicly and emphatically and repeatedly to be God. And I say this because there is no other religious founder in the history of the world who declares themselves to be God. They're always pointing to another guy. Here's the God. Here's the God. Jesus says, I am him. And I say this because some of you, I know you have been taught and you have heard and you have learned that Jesus actually never said he was God. Friends, I need you to know that that's actually not true. This is in fact why Jesus was killed. Because he stepped into a monotheistic religion and said, I am the true God. I am the fulfillment of all of these prophecies. And these prophecies pointed to that reality and then his ultimate miracle of being resurrected from the dead proved that he is in fact God. If you don't know Jesus, has God come to save you? Will you let him do that miracle in your life today? Will you just come to him? Will you you stop playing church? And will you just come to him and say, you're God, I'm not. I have sin, you have salvation. Will you take my sin and just give me your righteousness and I'll follow you for the rest of my life? Guys, some of you, you, you've been sitting in these chairs for so long, or chairs like these chairs, maybe a little bit more comfortable because these are the cheapest ones we could find, but you've been sitting in chairs like this for so, so long, and you've been listening for so long, the Bible being taught, you've been listening and hearing about Jesus and his gospel for so incredibly long, and you have never responded. And it's pride. It's pride that says, I don't want to answer to anyone. I want to functionally be my own God and make my own decisions and live my own way. And I don't want to submit to another. It's just pride. And Jesus is here and he's saying, I love you. I came for you. I've made a way for you. I can save you from your sin. Will you come to me? Will you come to Jesus today? And this is, this is not for me. This is for you. When you do that, I will rejoice with all of heaven singing that another one has come home. But this is for you. This is for your eternal joy so that you can know without a doubt that your sin has been forgiven and that you can be with God the Father forever in eternity. Jesus came as a fulfillment of this prophecy. Now, all the prophecies around Jesus were not just about his birth and his ministry, but they also concerned his death. Take a look at this. 500 years before the birth of Jesus, God gave us these words through the prophet Zechariah. All right? Then I said to them, If it seems good to you, give me my wages. But if not, keep them. And they weighed out as my wages 30 pieces of silver. Then the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, the lordly price at which I was priced by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. Doxa, I need you to understand this about God. God is very specific and cares a lot about the details. And we learned about this last year as we studied through the great Old Testament book of Daniel, but we see it here as well. And here, guys, the words of Zechariah were fulfilled by a man named Judas Iscariot. That Judas Iscariot was a fake disciple of Jesus who ultimately pretended and then he betrayed Jesus, handed him over to the authorities who eventually killed him. And Judas, if you remember, he did this deed for what payment? Do you remember? 30 pieces of silver. Just as Zechariah prophesied. 
And we see this fulfillment of prophecy in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 27. But after Jesus was betrayed by Judas, he was paid, or Judas was paid by the religious leaders, and he was racked with guilt. He was filled with shame, and before he hung himself because he didn't know what else to do, he did exactly what Zechariah said. That Judas came back to the religious leaders. He said, I don't want this money anymore. He tried to return it. They wouldn't take it. And so on his way out from the religious leaders, he threw it into the potter's house, which is what the specific portion of the temple was in those days. Guys, it's all real. It all happened just as God decreed. God promises and it happens. And here, I want you to see this, guys. We learn the great truth that God even works evil for good. You remember this in the Apostle Paul's writing in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that God works for the good of all those who love him? God uses this evil man of Judas and the evil religious leaders to bring about the greatest good that the world has ever seen. And I need you to know, guys, we have the same God today. We have the same God that He can use evil for good. And some of you, you have been betrayed and you've been wronged and evil and terrible things have come your way, fallen in your lap, punched you in the face. I just want to tell you to stick with Jesus and He'll find a way to make it work for good. This is what Jesus does. This is the promise of God. This is what we see in the fulfillment of this prophecy. This is our hope. You with me? This is like a funeral. Come on. This This is amazing. Number six. God tells us the coming of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the betrayal of Jesus, but he also specifically tells us of the death of Jesus. 1,000 years before the birth of Jesus, here's what Psalm 22 says. Verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Again, if you know your Bible, this is what Jesus quoted as he was dying on the cross for our sin. Then verse 16, dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Guys, this psalm was written by David approximately a thousand years before the birth of Jesus Christ. And I just want to highlight within this psalm the many references to the actual crucifixion of Jesus. Listen to this. In Matthew 27, listen to my words as you look at this verse. Matthew 27, 39, Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mark 15, 34, it's recorded that they mocked and hurled insults, shaking their heads at Jesus. Matthew 27, 46, history tells us that they shouted, He trusts in the Lord, let the Lord save him. Matthew 27, 35 says they nailed him to a cross, piercing his hands and his feet. And Luke 23, 34 says that they divided his clothes and they cast lots for them. Guys, do you see this? Is this expanding your view of Christmas? Is this like stirring a little bit of worship in you as you see the plan of God over thousands of years just kind of come to fruition for you? Doctor, and I'll tell you about this with Psalm 22. This Psalm 22 is so accurate and so precise and specific in nature that what David writes here, people that come to the Bible skeptically will say that this was not written before the crucifixion because it's too detailed. It had to have been written afterwards. But the evidence shows that this was written about a thousand years before. This is amazing, and this is Christmas. Okay, two more. 700 years before Christ, Isaiah prophesied that Jesus would be killed, and then he would be buried in a rich man's tomb. Isaiah 53, 9. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Now again, this is crazy. 700 years before Jesus was born, God told us exactly what was going to happen to him. And if you look, it says that he would, be, he would make his grave with the wicked. And if you know history, Jesus was crucified and killed alongside two thieves, fulfilling this prophecy. But Isaiah goes on to say that while they would make his grave with the wicked, he would also be, if you look, with a rich man in his death. And we know that Jesus was not rich. He was poor. But we also know that after Jesus was killed, a rich man named Joseph of Arimathea, who was a follower of Jesus, a lover of Jesus, a worshiper of Jesus, gifted Jesus his tomb to be buried in. That Joseph of Arimathea realized that they had no burial spot for Jesus and they were just going to discard his body because that's what they did in those times as customary. 
And Joseph of Arimathea is saying, no, I love and worship Jesus. He can have my tomb. And as Joseph decides to make this choice, he fulfilled the prophecy from Isaiah. And so Jesus is buried in the rich man's tomb. And everyone knew where this tomb was. Joseph of Arimathea, he had purchased it. He had a deed to the land. He, the government knew where it was at. Everybody knew where it was at, just like people know where your house is at today, today. And Jesus is sealed in that tomb with guards standing by. And then three days later, Jesus raises from death. And ultimately, the, the way that God ordained this was so that everyone knew where Jesus' dead body was laid. So that when he wasn't there anymore, everyone would know that he's alive. And this brings me to the last thing I'll share in Psalm 16, 1,000 years before Jesus. This is what the psalmist says. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. So not only did God prophesy concerning the life and the birth and the death of Jesus, but also his resurrection from the dead. Guys, isn't this crazy? Psalm 16 is simply saying that we all have sin, we all will die, but there is one who will not die or who will die but not remain dead because he has no sin and his name is Jesus. That if you look back at this psalm when it says, your holy one, I need you to understand this is not you. This is not your godly grandma who you've never heard cuss. This is not the Pope if you grew up Catholic. This is Jesus. That God looks down from heaven and he sees a bunch of unholy people in one holy one and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, your holy one will not see decay. That Jesus will be killed he will be buried but he will not stay dead he will raise victoriously conquering satan's sin death and hell and fulfilling what god promised four thousand years ago in genesis chapter three do you see this guys this is the gospel this is the gospel that we share every single week concerning the life the death the burial the resurrection of jesus all of this it did not come about after jesus was killed it wasn't like, we gotta, we got to f- figure out a way to memorialize Jesus. This gospel was prophesied hundreds and thousands of years before Jesus stepped into human history. This is Christmas. And we could, if we had more time, I would love to get into the prophecies about Jesus' second coming. That just as Jesus came the first time and God said it would happen, He says He will come a second time. And we know that it is true. And while we can't read the future and know the future, God is over the future, ruling the future. And he promises that Jesus will come again. And on that day, he is going to come as judge. And he will eradicate on that day. He will gather his people. The dead will rise. And he will eradicate Satan, sin, death, and hell forever. And everyone living in the dead will pass by the judgment seat of God and do what Paul, the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 14, where we will give an account for the life that we lived. And I will tell you that if you're standing there alone on that day without Jesus, while you could do that today and walk out of here not standing with Jesus, and it might be okay for you today, on that day, if you don't let Jesus and refuse to let Jesus take care of your sin, that day is going to be a horrible day. Because there will not be salvation, there will only be condemnation and damnation. And Jesus is here saying, I've come for you. I will come again. Come to me. Come to me. You need Jesus. We all need Jesus. So let me just end with this. Way at a time. The prophecies in the Bible, some of which we just looked at, guys, are are specific enough that the mathematical probability of Jesus fulfilling even a handful of them, let alone all of them, is staggeringly improbable. Maybe just impossible. And there's a guy named Peter Stoner who was the chairman of the departments of mathematics and astronomy at Pasadena College. And Stoner was just fascinated with the prophecies in the Bible. And so Stoner, what he did is he took a look at eight specific prophecies. So you had the, on a conser- really conservative, like you have like 60, maybe 61 at the lowest, over a little over 300 at the highest prophecies. Stoner took eight. Eight of these prophecies about Jesus, five of which we talked about today, 
And he came up with an extremely conservative probability for each one of these being fulfilled. And then he considered the likelihood of Jesus fulfilling just eight. Just eight of the prophecies in the Bible. I want to show you his conclusion. Here's how he said it. Speaking of the probability of Jesus fulfilling even just eight, let us try and visualize this chance. Suppose that we take 10 to the 17th power silver dollars and lay them on the face of Texas. They will cover all of the state two feet deep. Now mark one of these silver dollars and stir the whole mass thoroughly all over the state. Blindfold a man and tell him that he can travel as far as he wishes, but he must pick up one silver dollar and say this is the right one. What chance would he have of getting the right one? Listen, just the same chance that the prophets would have had of writing these eight prophecies and having them all come true in any one man from their day to present, providing they wrote using their own wisdom. Doxa, this is the word of God. And in this book are not just the words of men and women throughout the history of the world, but the very words of God breathed out for us. And this book tells us what is true about life in this world. It tells us what is true about God. It tells us what is true about us. It tells us what is true about our sin. And it tells us what we need to do to escape the reality of that sin. And this is why, guys, every single book of your Bible is all about Jesus. He's the point. It's Jesus. And this is what Christmas is just screaming out. And because this is a reality, guys, the only logical response is for us all to come to Jesus, to put our faith in him and to follow him in obedience. And so if you have not come to Jesus today, you need to. You need to come to Jesus. Don't wait. Just do it. And Christian, if you're here, you've loved Jesus. He's taken your sin. He's also Emmanuel. He's with you. Walk with him. Love him. Worship him. Obey him. Speak to him. Converse with him. Hear from him in the words of the Bible. And obey him as you live for his glory and the good of the world around you and those who love God loves. This is what Christmas is screaming out to us today. Let me pray. Father, I, I love you. God, as I come to know you more and more through your word. Um, I'm taken back by your, your power and your plan to love me through Jesus. And God, I, I just ask for those in here who have not come to faith in Jesus and have come, not come to Jesus and said, I have sin, I want you to take it. Holy Spirit, would you um, just cause faith to abound? Would you help them to understand and, and see and feel and experience your presence, your, your pleasure, your gospel? And would you save? And if you're here today and you're feeling like something, you just need to know that this is the Spirit of God prompting you to respond. Respond to Jesus. Come to him. And God, for those who are Christians here and they're loving you and they're following you imperfectly, but they're there, and we just thank you for your grace and Jesus, would you be who you say you are? Emmanuel, God with us, and would you help us and empower us to live for your glory and the good of the world? Expand our mind of what Christmas actually means so that we can worship you more fully. And we pray this in Jesus' name.